Shrek 2 is somehow even more reference dense than the original, so let's not waste any time and get straight into things. The opening story sequence is directly a callback to the first movie, while also being a general homage to bedtime fairy tales. And I promise they aren't all that literal. We have the big bad wolf still disguised as grandma laying in bed as he's known to do, reading Pork Illustrated instead of Sports Illustrated, while eating a big bag of bacon flavored pork rinds, really doubling down on the pork. Shrek and Fiona are away on their honeymoon in Hansel's Honeymoon Hideaway, a hut made of sweets directly from Hansel and Gretel. And now tying things back around to the big bad wolf, they get a knock on their door from Little Red Riding Hood. On the beach, a mermaid is washed up on top of Shrek, with the green tail, red hair, and purple seashell top, she's made to look almost identical to Disney's Ariel. Shrek and Fiona making out on the beach with the water splashing around them recreates an iconic shot from 1953's From Here to Eternity. We have a quick tribute to The Lord of the Rings, a trilogy that would have actually been quite new at the time, with these dwarves forging the One Ring for them, which then flies through the air and falls on Fiona's finger much like Frodo. It even has text emblazoned in fire on its side. During their quick fight in the forest, Fiona spin kicks on her head and does a massive uppercut which seemed to come straight from Street Fighter, and she peels away a layer of mud from Shrek's face to give him an upside upside down smooch like the iconic moment in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Their romantic mud bath is lit by jars filled with generic fairies, ones who are generally made to look like Tinkerbell. Donkey mentions playing Parcheesi, we can see it smashed up on the floor there, that's quite a literal direct reference to a real world board game. As the messenger arrives at their swamp, at the end of the musical procession, one trumpeter breaks off and starts playing the Hawaii Five-O theme. When Shrek accosts Fiona with Then how do you explain Sergeant Pompous in the Fancy Pants Club band? <laughs> is meant to follow the naming pattern of the Beatles album Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. When first departing the swamp, Donkey repeats Which is the theme from the old western Rawhide. Move him on, hit him up, hit him up, move him on, move him on, hit him up, Rawhide. They are told they need to head to the land of far, far away. Similar to new characters like the Fairy Godmother or Prince Charming, these all have their own complex histories and origins, so I can't really attach any of those to a specific fairy tale. Far, Far Away is made to be much like Hollywood, immediately apparent from the Hollywood-style sign out in the hills. We can briefly see that this is Romeo Drive taken from Romeo and Juliet, and a play on Hollywood's own Rodeo Drive, often referred to as one of the most expensive streets in the world, filled with luxury brands. In a string of verbal diarrhea, Donkey yells out, hey, good looking. We'll be back to pick you up later. coming verbatim from a corny 70s ad for Mr. Microphone. Hey, good looking, we'll be back to pick you up later. The production team had to specifically get permission to parody this famous Beverly Hills shield sign design. You can even see the Beverly Hills shield design is a registered trademark of the city of Beverly Hills in the movie's credits. Donkey mentions champagne wishes and caviar dreams. This is taken from the old 80s series Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, with the quote Donkey saying matching how Robin Leach would sign off each of those episodes. It's champagne wishes and caviar dreams on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. As this group is rolling up to the lavish far, far away in their carriage, impressed by their surroundings, Donkey comments on the swimming pools and movie stars, quoting a line from the Beverly Hillbillies theme song, a show which carried a similar premise of country hicks moving to the big rich city. Swimming pools, movie stars. Other small details around these streets, there is someone selling star maps, which is very literally directly from Hollywood. The newspaper appears to be the Daily Inquisitor, you know, kind of like a play on the medieval Inquisition. In this Inquisitor newspaper box, the front cover appears to be a mugshot of Goldilocks, showing she was a criminal even at the time of this movie, which makes sense, what with all the breaking and entering. 
when Shrek looks on from the carriage woefully, we are definitely not in the swamp anymore. Riffing off Dorothy's much quoted, You are not in Kansas anymore. You are on Pandora. From The Wizard of Oz. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. We can also see a poster on the wall for Lethal Arrow 4 instead of Lethal Weapon starring Robin and Lil John. And this animatronic sign of the fairy godmother doesn't appear to be anything Hollywood specific, but I'm not overly familiar, I might be missing something on that one. Now we have one of the most reference dense sections of the entire movie, I'll try and go through this as quick as possible. These streets are absolutely filled with parody brands of real world companies. Starbucks coffee is now Farbucks coffee, Amber Crombie and Fitch, Amber Crombie and Witch, Burger King, Burger Prince, Barney's New York, Barney's Old York, Versace, Versarchery, FAO Schwartz, Fifi Fo Schwartz, Baskin Robbins, Baskin Robin Hood, Pottery Barn, Pewtery Barn, Armani Exchange, Armani Armory, Tiffany and Co, Epiphany and Co. Tower Records, Tower of London Records, Old Navy, Old Navery, that's maybe one of my favorite ones, Banana Republic, Banana Kingdom. Now, the play on the Gap, I understand less well. They use Gap Queen, whereas the real world brand is just Gap, so I don't really get that one. Walking around on the streets, this woman is holding a Saxon Fifth Avenue bag, referencing Sax Fifth Avenue. At the same time, we see someone walking by with a white bag that appears to have a logo of a black silhouetted jouster on it. This makes me think of the Ralph Lauren Polo logo, but because of the way it's in motion, we never get a very clear look at it. And with the fairy godmother, they go to Friar's Fat Boy, which is a play on Frisch's Big Boy. Although the medieval meal that they order is clearly meant to be a play on McDonald's Happy Meal. The USPS Postal Service becomes the FFAPS. As we're exiting the Rodeo Drive, there is a glimpse of a few different princesses castles, including that of Cinderella and Rapunzel, with her yard and castle being completely covered in hair. We come to meet King Harold and Queen Lillian, who were named after Harold and Lillian Mickelson, a well-known couple working in Hollywood for decades. Lillian as a film researcher and Harold a production designer. When the argument breaks out over dinner, everyone begins shouting each other's names back and forth. Harold! Shrek! Fiona! Fiona! Mom! Harold! Donkey! This is recreating a similar scene from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Can it? Janet! Bad! Rocker! Janet! Dr. Scott! Janet! Bad! Rocker! Janet! Dr. Scott! Janet! Bad! Rocker! When weighing out the reality of their daughter being married to an ogre, they use the phrase Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right, Harold? A phrase that originated in the 90s sitcom Seinfeld. We're not gay! Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. Since then, it's become a rather common phrase, but there's still a slim chance it was an intentional reference to that famous episode. The fairy godmother floats in, encased in a bubble, with yet another reference to the Wizard of Oz, and this time, Glinda the Good Witch. During the fairy godmother's big musical number, she brings furniture to life, which could very much be a nod to Beauty and the Beast. She sings of making Fiona the kind of gal the prince would date, then plopping down in front of her a portrait of the real world Prince Charles, now King Charles III. Fiona's golden dress blowing upwards is in reference to Marilyn Monroe's film The Seven Year Itch. King Harold is voiced by John Cleese, and when the godmother comes to talk to him, he uses I know nothing, nothing generous, the older uh, hunting wound playing up a bit <laughs> as an excuse, referencing Cleese's other character, Basil Faulty in Faulty Tower, who would use a similar excuse when lying, instead referencing the Korean War. I fought the Korean War, you know, I killed four men. <laughs> Fiona's old childhood room is decorated with many posters of heartthrobs and bands. This Stonehenge poster is a direct reference to this famous pairing in Led Zeppelin. Overhead, she has Sir Justin, presumably meant to be Justin Timberlake. 
He and Cameron Diaz, who voices Fiona, were dating at the time. And Justin actually went on to voice Artie in Shrek 3. Loot Heroes is potentially a play on Guitar Hero. Don't have many other ideas there. But Knaves to Knights is definitely Boys to Men. The woman on the Chastity Belt World Tour poster makes me think of Britney Spears. While the Lancelot and Dragon Slayer look like they're recreating something specific like the Stonehenge poster, I myself could not find these specific references. The pub that Harold visits is named the Poison Apple, a direct reference to Snow White. We see more fairy tale creatures like Hook playing the piano or the headless horseman at the bar, as well as this frog. Hey, do I know you? Foreshadowing the eventual reveal in this movie. There's also just a bunch of funny signs on the wall, like you must be 21 to drink but written in Roman numerals, or pick your poison then listing actual poisons. I just love those sort of small details. While walking with Shrek, Yeah, and there's that bush that's shaped like Shirley Bassett! Who is a world famous Welsh singer. Puss in Boots from top to bottom is a very on-the-nose homage to Zorro, a character who is also famously portrayed by Antonio Banderas. And to properly drive that homage home, Puss carves a P into the tree with three swipes of his sword, same as Zorro would do with a Z. When attacking Shrek crawling up his shirt, the way Puss bursts from Shrek's shirt is meant to recreate the birthing of a new xenomorph in Alien. Donkey threatens to neuter Puss. I say we take the sword and neuter him right here. Give him the Bob Barker treatment. The longtime Price is Right host always ended his shows imploring fans to have their pets spayed or neutered. Have your pets spayed or neutered. Goodbye, buddy. Rest in peace, Bob. You'll be missed. While trying to think of something sad, Donkey mentions a farmer trying to sell him for magic beans, presumably referencing the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Donkey doesn't sing as often in this movie, but when their new adventure begins, he sings Ain't No Stoppin' Us Now, We're On The Move, the 1979 disco hit from McFadden and Whitehead. When they're approaching this hut, Donkey refers to it as the Old Keebler Place, referring to the Keebler elves, who in their advertisements would make their cookies in a little hut. Inside the Godmother's Cottage, there are previous success stories on the walls, like a before and after of Cinderella becoming a princess, and several less specific ones, like seeing a pig become a flying pig, which is then signed, thanks FGM, fairy godmother, Pigasus, which is just a phenomenal name. There's also a horse that becomes a unicorn, and some woman who seemingly wanted to become a nasty swamp witch. Good for them, I guess. One of the first potions on the conveyor belt is labeled as Phi Agra and comes in a little blue bottle. Eh? Hey. I really do enjoy this employee of the month sign that is just filled with a bunch of unidentifiable generic henchmen. They managed to come both before minions and among us, even though it makes me think of both. All the names in this list are not ones I could find anywhere in the credits, so I kind of wonder if they're just random or probably of some significance to the animators or art department, you know, their kids or something like that. But later on, when this little pigeon holds up the potion inventory, we see repeats. Penelope Potion, Theo Thunder Mix, the second word is hard to read, and Pascal Potion. So those names clearly have some significance, whether or not the rest of them do. However, three that I know for certain are self-inserts come in this potion inventory. Down in the bottom right, there is the Vandermeer Vaccine, Something Goodwin, the first word is hard to make out, and Kohler Knight. These are named for Stacy Vandermeer, the art department production supervisor, as well as Sarah Maria Goodwin, and Travis Kohler, who are both art department production assistants. There are also a few more gags hidden on here, such as Preparation Hunch for Preparation H, Alpha Seltzer for Alka Seltzer, Hex Lax for X Lax, as well as Beetlejuice, which isn't really a parody and more just kind of a fun bit of wordplay, because Beetlejuice is not juice. <laughs> and way down there, they just literally have Papa Smurf. The Godmother exclaims, What in Grimm's name are you doing here? Taken from the Brothers Grimm, German folklore authors from the 1800s responsible for many well-known fairy tales, who I suppose would be god-like figures to these creatures. When the Godmother is rifling through old fairy tale books to check for ogres, the final one on her list is Pretty Woman. The Little Mermaid, Pretty Woman! No, 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 no! The 1990 rom-com starring Julia Roberts and Richard Gere. 
Donkey asks Puss to get his fine Corinthian footwear out of his face, referencing an old series of Chrysler Cordoba commercials where the host Ricardo Montalban would highlight the car's luxurious seats made of fine Corinthian leather. Available even in fine Corinthian leather. When they're making their grand escape, they slide under the door, Puss reaches back to grab his hat at the last possible moment, lifted straight from Indiana Jones. As a wave of potions is rolling through the floor, two of the henchmen turn into Lumiere and Cogsworth from Beauty and the Beast, but they're only on screen for about half a second. Afterwards, when they're outside and it starts to rain, Donkey shouts, I'm melting! I'm melting! Like the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wizard of Oz. I'm melting! Donkey attempts to cheer Shrek up with his rendition of Tomorrow, which is most commonly associated with the Broadway classic Annie. Also, as a part of his big freakout, thinking he's dying, he shouts, I'm coming, Elizabeth! Something Fred Sanford would say in Sanford and Son when he was surprised or overwhelmed, joking that he'd keel over and rejoin his late wife. Elizabeth! I'm coming, honey! When Shrek wakes up to several women fawning over him, one informs him, Here, I fetched you a pail of water. Starting as a rather subtle nod to Jack and Jill, who went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, but then moments later, she specifically says her name is Jill, so not so subtle. Much like another orange cartoon cat, Puss expresses his disdain for the first day of the week. I hate Mondays. In reference to Garfield. During the red carpet rollout, in addition to fairy tale references to the likes of Miss Muffet, Hansel and Gretel, Tom Thumb and Thumbelina, and the Sleeping Beauty, our announcer is very clearly a parody of Joan Rivers. All of this being broadcasted by M.E. Medieval Entertainment. I guess a company that's just called Entertainment doesn't leave a lot of room for clever wordplay. Harold is given a love potion in a little pink bottle, and it has the Roman numeral 9 on the side. This is a nod to the 1959 song Love Potion No. 9, which some people may be more familiar with through the 1992 rom-com of the same name. The cast of Shrek's returning fairy tale friends are all watching Nights, a parody of the American reality program that follows police officers around cops. And the event they're viewing is a parody of the real-life O.J. Simpson car chase, during which he fled in a white Ford Bronco, whereas here the white Bronco is a transformed donkey. The hot air balloons are the FFAPD, a play on the LAPD, so even though the show is knights, they are seemingly still police. The narrator refers to them as the men in steel instead of the men in blue. And while the catnip gag is funny, catnip, that's uh, no mind. My favorite part is that rather than pepper spraying Shrek, they just grind pepper straight into his eyes like they're finishing a nice pasta. Gingy asks if they could switch over to Wheel of Torture. This is a play on the game show Wheel of Fortune. During the breakout sequence, when Pinocchio is lowered down, dangling above the floor from his own strings, this is a play on the iconic scene from the original Mission Impossible, and they literally even use that theme song. As brief as it is, the ominous shack of the Muffin Man, literally on Drury Lane, with the lightning cracking in the background and Gingy exclaiming, It's alive! are broadly referencing Frankenstein. It's alive! It's alive! However, the shaking tea in their mugs is instead from Jurassic Park. And after a quick little callback to the first movie, Not the gumdrop button! The whale Mongo makes is very Godzilla-like. <laughs> but not precisely. And while we're chaining together references, the naming of this gargantuan gingerbread guy is likely in reference to the dim-witted Mongo from Mel Brooks's classic Blazing Saddles. When Mongo is dunked into the moat, he tells Gingy to be good, which is the last thing E.T. says to Elliot in E.T. the Extraterrestrial. As the fairy godmother is performing at the ball, rolling around and singing atop the piano in a red dress, this is recreating Michelle Pfeiffer's scene from 1989's The Fabulous Baker Boys. And the stage it's being performed on looks an awful lot like the Hollywood Bowl. The king's true identity is teased a few other times. One of the most obvious is the fact that his wife's name, Lillian, would be Lily, for short. And during the climactic royal ball, Harold and Lillian are sitting in front of a backdrop of a lily pond. 
After everything's all resolved and people are celebrating, during that big ending dance number, Pinocchio busts out some of Michael Jackson's famous dance moves, while Puss recreates the famous water dump scene from 1983's Flashdance. And before we close things out entirely, I want to take a very quick cursory glance at the fantastic DVD menu that this movie had. The paneled layout of each character is meant to resemble the Brady Bunch, with Donkey rattling off a bunch of fake sequel titles referencing real movies. What about Shrek 2, Day of the Donkey? Day of the Dead. Oh, Shrek 2, The Donkey's Revenge. Yes. Halloween 2, Caliber's Revenge. Too fast, too donkey. donkey. Just too fast, too furious. Oh, okay. How about Shrek 2? A donkey will rise on. Oh. Oddly, this doesn't seem to be a parody of anything specific and is more a sweeping parody of movie titles. Why is Shrek 2? Dead Donkey's Society. Oh. This is torch. Dead Poets Society. Or something like Shrek 2, the, the yeah. Fellowship of the Donkey. The Fellowship of the Ring. Shrek 2, uh, the Donkey King. I like that. The Lion King. Well, Shrek 2. The, the real jackass movie! What? Yeah. Jackass the movie! Shrek 2! Donkey Reloaded! No. No. The Matrix Reloaded! How about this? Shrek 2, dude, where's my donkey? <laughs> oh, there he is, cut from the movie because he talks too much! <laughs> dude, where's my car? I'm certain there are more references and gags layered all throughout that DVD menu, but at the very least I thought I would cover this very simple menu screen. Since it's quite iconic, I think it's very memorable for anyone who bought that movie, and back in 2004 I bet kinda everyone bought that movie. <laughs> if this video is done in time for the end of September, I will have made shrek Timber just by the skin of my teeth. I imagine this upload will have spilled over into shrek Tober by the time I've bought YouTube on some copyright disputes. I Ideally, I would do one of these a year, making my way through the series each September, but if there's a massive outcry for Shrek the Third immediately after this, then I may have to reconsider that plan. While researching this, I came across a lot of different things where fans consider this to be their favorite Shrek movie. I feel like the original and this one are on pretty even footing for me, with the original narrowly edging it out, potentially just because I've watched it that many more times growing up. You'll all have to let me know what your favorite Shrek movie is. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.